Hey everybody, this is my favorite part of math, word problems. Okay. I had to figure out how to do this, otherwise I was going to die in my math classes. So... As a kid, I really did like math. I was good at that. While my brother was playing hockey, I'd be in the stands doing like math worksheets and stuff like that. I just basically want to start, like, in my story, I remember from my earliest memories wanting to be a girl and uh, feeling like I didn't quite belong with the boys. So I grew up in a, a typical run-of-the-mill Catholic family. I'm second born, and I have an amazing older brother, but he's two years older than me and two years stronger than me. So when we played together, we always, uh, I always ended up second and he always ended up first. I learned very quickly that I wasn't good at what I thought were boy things. Without really choosing it at the time, I just began to accept my place as second and not see myself as being good enough to be first as a boy. It wasn't my brother's fault. He, we were just little boys playing. I got bullied in the hockey dressing room. I, I mean, I, I think everybody gets bullied a little bit, but sometimes I was really terrorized by a couple of the guys and I hated it. If you weren't the gay kid, you were safe. If you were, if you were assumed to be the gay kid on the hockey team or in the schoolyard, you're dead meat. You just deflected that as much as you could, even though you're, you're wondering, oh my gosh, that's me. What if people found out? I remember thinking at one point later on that if this is what it meant to be a boy, I just didn't want anything to do with it. I didn't want anything to do with it. There was this incident with Valentine's Day and, you know, everyone was so excited because, you know, you get to share Valentine's, this is what you did back in the day. Well, I made my little Valentine's Day, like, you know, my little box, I guess, and I didn't get any Valentine's. I remember thinking in that moment, why doesn't anyone love me? And having that kind of settle into someone's mind frame, um, that's that's really something I don't wish any kid would have to experience. I was more like the girls because I've been hanging out with them for so long that the boys were my compliment. The boys were the compliment to who I was in terms of like interests and activities, so to speak. Like, not, I'm not talking about physiological complementarity, obviously. But I, in, in my mind, as an 11 year old boy, my question was if I'm going to have someone special in my life, maybe it's supposed to be a boy because they would be a good match with me. I, I didn't really give much thought to the idea that I must be gay. We weren't immersed in the style of language that says gay, straight, everything in between. You know, I wondered about it, and but I also was attracted to women too. You know, I'm dropping off a friend and stuff like that in high school and I'm like, I had this deep draw in my heart, like, should I go and kiss him? You know, I remember having those thoughts because I wanted that intimacy. I was craving that male friendship. I went down the roads of uh, male homosexual porn, and I remember looking at it the first time thinking, okay, right, if I, if I look at this and I like it, then I'll know, right? Because I was all these questions, right? Um, but, but I looked at it and I was totally hooked, so, and I was partially disgusted by what I saw, but I remember not being able to look away. And uh, if K is negative, then we have, I'm not gonna write it down. If K is negative, then we have, uh, sorry, oh, I'm doing the wrong thing. If this value is negative. So I was a late teen when I got molested, and um, I, uh, I lived in a state of fear and running for those 10 years. So my body reacted during, the, during that, like physiologically, and I was so terrified of, oh, I don't want to be the gay kid, you know, but this happened, I must be gay, um, that I just ran even harder into unchaste pursuits of women trying to prove to myself that I was straight. I hurt a lot of people on the way. I hurt a lot of people on the way. I just remember one day, I've already moved away, way up north, I was 27, and I was like, using this kind of porn again, where I was like, I just can't run anymore. I was done. I just couldn't run anymore. I felt like I was living a lie, you know? And so I came out to myself and said, this is who I am. And then I thought about the fear of telling my family. If there's anyone out there, if someone ever tells you, you know, hey, I'm gay, by the way, like, they might have gone through a huge process of, of building the strength to reveal that in-depth degree of self-honesty with you. 
it's very it takes a big risk for a lot of people and I understand that firsthand I remember my brother was gonna drive me to the airport and uh, I was like if I die on this flight I have to I have to make sure everything's out on the table before I die on this flight because I was terrified, you know, my first flight. And I just burst and all the pain, all the pain of feeling abandoned and unloved, the sorrow of hurting people through the years of addiction, all that stuff, I just poured it all out and we were standing up in the kitchen and he just, he just held me, you know, he held me up. <laughs> And I just soaked his shirt with tears and snot, and uh, and he didn't care, you know. He just he just held me. I needed to be held. I needed to be held. I needed I needed to be reassured that I was lovable, you know. And it was my brother of all people, you know. I used to be jealous of him that he, you know, he was different than uh, all. He he was he was he showed me Christ's love in that moment, you know. Alright, now we're going to get into some trickier stuff. Now what a transformation means, that if you have something, whatever it is, it's a line, a triangle, whatever, a transformation means we are doing something to it to change it. Maybe we're making this triangle show up over here. One, one, one thing in particular, real quick here, is that uh, when I was 28 or 29, somewhere around there, there was a particular gay activist who who mentioned that environment plays a factor in the development of our attractions. I had began to really reflect on, on these questions about why am I the way I am today? So like I said, this, there was a gay activist who invited me to do this. So I went home, I read everything I could. I have probably three solid days, about eight hours a day of reading things online. And here's what I discovered. Pretty much everyone thinks that they're right on this. And I was just so fed up with reading contradictory positions. I was like, okay, enough of all of this. I just want to know what's true. What's true? I couldn't set my watch to anything of truth in the rest of my life. It was, I was a disaster. And I had no stability. But math was constant. I measured things through that lens of, of if something's different, it needs to be recognized as different. You know, like a four is not a five. Everything I read online was saying that uh, because you experience these attractions, it means you are gay. This is who you are. Everywhere. And I was like, well, wait a second. Uh, wait a second. I didn't specifically choose these attractions. But I still have the right and the ability to, to choose how I perceive myself. If I said 13 minus 1, that is not the same as 1 minus 13. Not the same, not the same, not the same, right? So we go place value, order, and then we just process what we're doing here and use our intuition. I stumbled across the miracle of Lanciano, Italy, and then other Eucharistic miracles. And I was like, something is up here. You cannot roll my grace from me. It really made me continue to dive into the, 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 the meaning of what am I really doing here? Is this Eucharist a membership card or is it actually Jesus Christ? And, and if it's Jesus Christ, it is my house in order to receive him. The image of the crucifix, I find more reassuring than anything. Suffering is inevitable in our world. And seeing Christ on the cross with his arms out, with his wounds and his face in agony, it reminds me that when I suffer, that He suffered first for me. Being able to offer that to the Lord and say, Yes, Lord, I'll accept this suffering. Of course, I don't want it. But I'll accept it because I love you. I'm confident that He knows the desires of my heart for unity with Him. A life without a, a way to understand suffering in terms of uh, redemptive suffering, as they say, right? Life wouldn't make sense. Oh man, I had the big one. You know the big confession? Like when you come, you've been away for a while, and you, you come back, oh man. I wish the joy of that gift could be tasted by every single person. To know truly that those sins confessed, you know, that's like the cause of the dark side being lifted out of you.
as I gained in self-control and was making better decisions in my life, I began to feel more confident in my masculinity. I was like, I can do this. I, I can make choices that make me feel like more of a man and actually healed from the traumas that I mentioned before to do with not wanting to be a boy, right? I didn't want to be a boy, but as those, as I addressed those one by one, as I walked into those um, and began to experience healing on those, I didn't have the need, the need to escape being a boy anymore. So the entire transgender angle of my story, which began from my earliest memories, uh, that went away. It just happened as the natural fruit of the pursuit of holiness. And that was, that was the part that was most mind-blowing. We have to be honest with ourselves about the attractions and inclinations we experience. The church wants that of us, that self-honesty. Um, but in that, I understand that when people are, are on that, in that journey, uh, they may use language like gay and straight, and that's okay, because that's where they are at the time. But the question is, like, Jesus never leaves us where we are, does he? You know, the church never leaves us where we are either. You know, at the beginning, I was like, I'm gay, how do I fit in? I'm gay, how do I fit in? Or I'm transgender, how do I fit in? And then I'm realizing later, it's like, am I really? What really makes a person gay? What makes a person transgender? It seems like a lot of people who have chosen to move on past those labels don't get a voice because a lot of people don't think they exist and or if they do exist they're like some kind of walking fraud like they're lying to themselves i don't have to say that i'm gay because these are these attractions are part of my story i i don't have to make that who i am because at this point i had really began to fall in love with jesus more and more and i was like the more i grew with him the more he gave me that desire to, to just let go as much as I could. If we have ideas that are contrary to the church on difficult issues, for example, what makes us attached to that, you know? Am I, am I pursuing spiritual fatherhood well if I say that my wisdom in my 37 years is greater than the entire collection of wisdom in the church? I find that a little hard to believe. One of the recent talks I gave, I got an email from my dad the night before. You can do it, period. So proud of you. Like at the end of the day, I'm just I'm just some guy who's trying to trying to knit his patch of the quilt and trying to hopefully try to be the reason why someone might want to love Jesus Christ a little more. And that's really all I can do.